uh, and introduce our last speaker of the day, um, Dr. Christian Mix, who's at the RGZM, um, Mites. Um, Christian is, is known for a whole range of interests. Uh, he is one of uh, Thomas Fisher's um, coterie of acolytes who have, who have gone out into the world as it were, uh, spreading uh, Roman military cooking studies. Uh, from, if you might call it, the Curl School. Um, you have got also his um, recent publication in two versions, a slimline one and a great thick, heavy tome of the uh, depot find of late Roman language for uh, on the Rhine. Um, and in seeking parallels to the design of helmets where, again, one single horde find moves the goalposts quite uh, quite radically. Um, uh, he has virtually reinvented the study of late Roman helmets generally, um, and he's going to speak to us this afternoon about um, segmental helmets as one of these. Uh, uh, thank you, John, for the introduction, and um, thank you much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad to be here. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, dear uh, late Roman soldiers, I know uh, some of them are here in the auditory somewhere. Um, for several centuries, starting from the days from the advanced republic up to the third century AD, the development of the regular Roman military helmets appears fairly uniform. Despite different helmets types, various fashion effects and foreign influences, which lead to striking variations and details, some characteristic basic features remain nearly unchanged. These basic char characteristics include a helmet bowl, which has been made in one piece of metal usually connected with a directly integrated and not separately attached neck guard, as well as a pair of large cheek pieces, which are connected to the bowl by hinges mounted on the interior side of the helmet. So far, there has been only very rare evidence of the nature, the appearance and the attachments of a helmet liner. But some indications suggest the use of pads, which were normally separated from the helmet, or, as it could be illustrated by some textile defines from Ewer Europos in Syria, also the use of a more complex separate pad cap with integrated extensions for the cheek pieces. Only the widespread introduction of segmented helmets at the end of the third century AD led to a substantial break with the former Roman helmet tradition. Although it has to be discussed to what extent segmented helmets have been already used by some Roman auxiliary units at, le at least since the beginning of the second century AD, their way of construction obviously stayed foreign till the beginning of the late imperial period. The collective term segmented helmets includes helmets of very different constructions. They are characterized by the fact that their bowl has been composed of several separate manufactured pieces, as it is demonstrated here on the example of a so-called rich helmet. Also the neck protection, which is often only a short mail or scale armor, is now always a separate element which has been attached to the helmet bowl in the same way as the cheek pieces, that means here by a combination of leather straps and rivets, and sometimes also small buckles. In some rare cases where hinges still have been used, they are now usually mounted on the outside of the helmet. Moreover, char characteristic rows of stitching holes along the edges of the metal helmet components occasionally connected with organic remains on the interior side, can be rated for the first time as a clear evidence for a close and permanent collection between the helmets and their linings. In the surroundings of the late Roman and all Byzantine army from the late 3rd till the beginning of the 7th century AD, 
Many different constructed kinds of segmented helmets can be detected. The different uh, scientific denotations are based on the characteristic shape of the main elements that have been used for connecting the several segments of the particular helmet bow. Unfortunately, some of the terms uh, so far only exist in German, but I've tried to translate them as good as possible into English, intending to enlighten the constructional differences a little bit better. The main connecting element of the so-called rich helmets, like an example of a late 4th century, early 5th century AD date from the fortress at Dunapentele in Takiza in Hungary, is a band-like metal sheet with an embossed or folded up central ridge along the longitudinal axis. The mentioned elements run along the helmet's crest from the forehead to the neck. It is fastened to the bowl by segment, uh, the, to the bowl segments by rivets. The ridge stabilizes the sheet. Sometimes, depending on its design, it can be seen also as an additional protective element against strikes of hostile weapons. Close related to the rich helmets are the so-called band helmets, or, or better, uh, crest band helmets, on which only the corresponding embossed ridge is absent. The main connecting element is just a flat metal strip running from the forehead to the neck. Sometimes that crest band is rectangular crossed by a similar strip which runs over the helmet's top from ear to ear. In such cases, we have to speak of a crossed band's helmet. Strutz helmet, Spangenhelme, auch im English, uh, also in English uh, used term, in contrast, have no connecting element that runs completely over the bowl. The basic construction consists of four or more short struts, spangen, which are fastened together by a ruetted circular metal plate on the helmet's top. To the inner side of the train work, the bowl segments have been attached by rivets. In addition, a stabilizing metal rim band along the feet of the bowl is usual. On rich helmets and crest band helmets, uh, helmet, however, such rim bands were only optional. No real bowl segments were used for the construction of lamellar helmets. These helmets were constructed out of a huge amount of equifunctional slim metal strips which were overlapped each other and were normally bound together in that position by leather strings or metal wires. For this purpose, each lamella has several string holes. Following the same idea, also the bell-shaped top cap in which the upper ends of the lamellas were bound, bundled were only tied to the bowl. Due to the special way of bounding, the entire construction of lamellar helmets was relatively flexible and could probably absorb hostile strikes very well. In contrary, some helmets are made only of large lamellar bowl segments without using special elements of their for their connection. The segments of these bowl uh, segment helmets overlap each other in a small zone along their lateral edges. In that zone, they are connected only by rivets. It is still unclear if such simple helmets have been used already in late antiquity, because it seems uh, that some datings to the 5th century AD, which occasionally occur in the scientific literature, were based to a greater extent on authors' impressions than on special archaeological records. Still questionable is also to what extent we must expect the use of the so-called skeleton helmets in the Roman and early Byzantine armies. Skeleton helmets show a basket-like framework composed of branched out or rectangular crossed metal strips which are rivetted together at specific points. This metal skeleton was either mounted on the outer face of a cap made uh, of organic material, like leather, felt, or something else, or contrarywise, 
So organic and sometimes also metal components were attached on the outer side of the skeleton. The, per the perishability of the organic material often uh, complicates a doubtless interpretation. Helmets, like the here de uh, depicted example from a northeastern Pontic grave of the later second century AD at Stanitsa Tbilisskaya in Russia, or the representation of rectangular uh, cancellated uh, skeleton helmets of Sarmatian cavalrymen on Trans Kalam, established in AD 113, illustrates uh, that la at, la at least in the surroundings of the Roman army, helmets of the mentioned construction already appeared quite early. Among the looted Dacian and Zamatian weapons that are represented on the base of Trans Calum, also further segmented helmets of different construction can be noted, for which it is possible to find substantial analogies. For example, a very detailed image crest band helmet that seems to have similar constructional features and proportions like a 6th century or 7th century Zazanian helmet from northern Iran, or the image of a possible rich helmet, which proportions can be compared with another oriental helmet dated to late antiquity. To the best known representations of possible segmented helmets on Trian's column belong at last some conical shaped items. They are usually interpreted as strong evidence for uh, Dacian or Sarmatian, or let's say uh, a Transdanubian origin of the Strats helmets, which have been subsequently used in the later Roman army, as probably the here shown iron example from Deir el Medini and Upper Egypt illustrates. Some helmets in, on the column like uh, that one on the right image here, seems to show even the flat round plate, which is characteristic for the discussed type of construction. Nevertheless, our conclusions regarding an adoption of the strut helmets by the Roman army should be not focused too close to the above mentioned tribes and region. If the dating of a supposed Persian weapon from Zardes uh, in Western Asia Minor to the 6th century BC is appropriated, as the excavator claims, we would have to consider that stretch helmet-like constructions had a very long tradition also in the Near East. Therefore, the Strats helmets of the late Roman and Byzantine armies must not necessarily be inspired by the equipment of second century enemies at the Danube. The less because the material based doubtless proofs of an application of such helmets in the early to mid imperial Roman army are so far absent. Although some indications suggest that uh, segmented helmets could have been part of the equipment of some specialized Roman auxiliary units. As far uh, as, for example, eastern archers, also uh, already since the end of the early imperial principate, that uh, already since the end of the early principate. However, we have to be aware of the risks and problems which are included in the interpretation of weapons on monuments like the Trajan's column. Concerning the regular infantry helmets, for instance, which representations on the mentioned column uh, could also lead to the impression of segmented constructions, we are used to see many details just as an artistic abstraction of the decorative bands, crest holders, slots, or reinforcements, which are tested by real finds of contemporary weapons. That's lead, uh, that leads to the question why the helmets of auxiliary archers should be interpreted in a completely different way. In some cases, the supposed helmet segments or st uh, struts could be based also just on an abstraction of artistic misunderstanding of reinforcements or radial arranged decorations, as it can be seen here on a similar conical helmet from the later first uh, or second century AD grave 
at Bryastovets in Bulgaria. Due to a very small and geographical as well as temporal wide scratched amount of segmented origin null helmets, the difficulties of the interpretation of pictorial representations also continue for images from the 3rd century AD. So on the well-known wall graffiti of a problem uh, Parsian or Zazanian cataphract at Eura Europos in Syria, for example, could be meant a helmet of a similar type of construction as it is attested by some late 1st to 2nd century AD items from a group of Acrestian graves at the Gorodskoy farm in Russia, northeast from the Black Sea. But given to the geographical and temporal distance between that finds and the Duryo graffiti, a too close equalization seems to be not serious. Nevertheless, the uh, Gorodskoy helmets illustrate, illustrate once more the large spectrum of possible constructional variants we have to consider if we try to connect artistic representations or monuments with real objects. This statement, again, applies for the helmets which Roman soldiers wear on the Ark of Galerius, built at Salonica in Greece around AD uh, 303. Here, for the first time, a greater number of Roman troops seems to be regularly equipped with segmented helmets. According to the analysis of Simon James, it is absolutely admissible to discuss the similarities of the presented helmets with the special features of a late Roman or early Byzantine helm helmet of unclear dating that has been found at Deir el Medini in Upper Egypt. But finally, the common elements are not sufficient to date the rise of the Strutz helmets of uh, Deir el Medini Leiden type already to the end of the 3rd century AD. Just as well, the representations on the Ark of Galerius could imply also helmets with a partly lamellar bowl, uh, a bell-shaped top cap and a flexible neck protection, as uh, there are, for instance, uh, on helmet fragments from uh, late 4th to early 5th century tomb in Kalkni, Russia, not far from the uh, west coast of the Caspian Sea. Also, the representations of nose guards does not narrow the range of interpretations to a strictly limited number of segmented helmets. This can be already easily proved by finds like an iron conical helmet from the first century AD Sarmatian grave at uh, Kazanskaya in the northeastern Pontic Krasnodar region of Russia, or the well known Zazanian ridge helmet from Dura Oropos in Syria which was found in a counter mine that collapsed during the Zanian siege uh, of the city in AD 256. According to a conclusive theory by Simon James, it could have been an oriental helmet like uh, the last one, which, uh, by which the genesis of segmented Roman helmets in the later third century was signif significantly inspired. The so far first real and doubtless evidence uh, for the mentioned genesis may be uh, an already fully developed Roman ridge helmet from the final destruction layer in the upper city of Augusta Raurica Augst in Switzerland. The layer is dated to the years around AD 273 uh, 275. Although the closer finding context of the helmet uh, cannot be denoted as uh, doubtless undisturbed. However, there exists no accompanying f uh, small finds which have to be necessarily dated after the last quarter of the 3rd century AD. A comparison with uh, the Zazanian helmet from Dua Orpos points out that the proportions and features of the oriental archetypes were not simply copied by the uh, Roman ridge helmets but they have been transferred into a more Roman-like design. Among other things, that design referred solid uh, cheek pieces 
and initially also a solid neck guard. It's also remarkable that on the majority of uh, the late Roman helmets, the lower rim of the bowl, the cheek pieces and the neck guard have been featured with a row of stitching holes along their edges. The holes were reserved for the fastening of a liner. The rims of that liner was turned around the edges to the exterior side of the mentioned helmet components and then fixed by a leather string which was rattled through their stitching holes. Amongst other, an application of pelt is uh, documented by some good preserved remains of liners on Strutt's helmets of the 6th century AD. The pelt was attached with its hairy side towards the metal. In addition, the fixation of the liner on the lower rim of the helmet bowl provides a possibility, dependent on the liner's design, that there is an empty space between a liner built cap and the metal in the top of the helmet bowl existed. Such a space is one of the best protections against the impact of hostile weapons. You can still find it on modern steel helmets too. The occurrence, the occurrence of the characteristic row of stitching holes on some helmet bowl fragments from the so-called Waffenmagazin in the legendary fortress of Canuntum in Austria, a uh, building which uh, inventories normally date to the second or at latest uh, older third century AD, as well as on the secondary alternate uh, mid-imperial helmet on in the archaeological museum at Florence in Italy, could lead to the idea of an expanded transitional phase from the older Roman helmet tradition to the new segmented construction in the course of the 3rd century AD. That idea can be supported if we consider that the rich helmet from Augst was already demounted when he got into the ground at the end of the 3rd century AD. So, in my opinion, uh, the old theory must be refused according to which the first types of late Roman segmented helmets were introduced to the Roman army during a supposed official reform of the military equipment under the reign of Emperor Constantine I. It has been thought that in the mentioned reform, the segmented constructions were favored because of the idea that in the new established state arms factories, they could have been easier and faster manufactured than the traditional types of Roman military helmets. In contrast to that theory, I think that segmented helmets probably came into fashion as a result of the continuous contact of the Roman army with their oriental archetypes during the extensive Parthian and Sasanian wars of the 3rd century AD. Finally, at the end of the century, they have been just adapted to the production of the new state's arms factory as an already established kind of Roman standard helmets. Besides, also the meaning should be evaluated that the segmented helmets could be faster manufactured than the one-piece helmet of the first to the third century. Because already the time that is necessary to cover, to cover the iron basic segments of the rich helmets was decorated and gilded silver or copper sheets free from distortions should be not calculated too short. Referring to the current state of research, we must have to assume that nearly all Roman rich helmets once were covered with such gilded sheets. The recycling of those sheets is obviously the main reason why in archaeological excavation the iron helmets were often found in a completely disassembled condition. As in the case of an iron helmet from the fortress of Duna Pentele in Takiza in Hungary, this option is sometimes confirmed by small remains of removed uh, precious sheets and silver rivets. On the other hand, a deposit with two small parcels, which has been found in the fortress of also Hetany, Jovia, also in Hungary, only consists of the removed and folded silver elements of an otherwise unknown Roman rich helmet. So the deposit affirms the usual practice 
of the helmet's destruction once again for, uh, from a different perspective. Besides such cover sheets, also constructional elements of nearly pure copper appeared on Roman helmets for the first time now. The pure copper, as it is used for uh, crest uh, components of rich helmet here in the slides, was probably easier to handle during the process of fire gilding than copper alloys. The fact that the relatively soft copper is not so much resistant against the impact of hostile weapons was, having the iron basic elements of the helmet in mind, obviously less important. As, for example, the helmet from Augs and other items um, that has been lost or sacrificed in a uh, bog uh, at uh, Donna Helena Wayne around AD uh, 320 illustrate uh, the two main types of Roman witch helmets were already in use during the reign of Constantine the first means AD 306 to 337. It is often supposed, and especially in the case of the Derna find, also attested by an inscription, that the more heavy and elaborated helmets of the Derna Bacassovo type belonged to the cavalry, and the more lighter items of Duna Pantale and Takisa type have been used by infantry units or the first mentioned type was equipment of the higher ranged field army, and the second type belonged to the lower graded border troops. But till now such a sharp uh, classification is not affirmed by the fine context of the helmets. So far, rich helmets of both types have been found mainly along the border zone of the empire and sometimes also together in the same archaeological context. Right from the beginning, uh, also some very similar uh, crest band helmets were found along, uh, along with them. During the 4th century AD, the crest band helmet seems to have followed largely the same topology like the ridge helmets. This is given for the Duna Pantale Interkisa type, here demonstrated by an example of a crest band helmet from a late 4th, early 5th century AD grave in Gaul Haditha in Jordan, as well as uh, for the uh, Donna Bacassovo type, here illustrated by a very rich decorated ridge helmet from a deposit at Bacassovo in Serbia, and a similar crest band helmet from the bank of the Danube at Budapest Equincum in Hungary. Their glass and lace probably refers to related decorations with the real jewels on the emperor's helmet, as it is shown on a silver metopilum, which was minted by Constantine I on the occasion of his decanalia or vicenalia in AD 315 or 325 to 26. According to that parallel, it is discussable if helmets like the mansion finds from Bercasovo and Budapest were, uh, were reserved for members of the Emperor's Guard or at least uh, high-ranked officers. As a further feature uh, presented on the multiplum of Constantine, we have to notice a bottom-like badge in front of the helmet's crest. The badge is decorated with the Greek letters he and Rho, the monogram of Jesus Christ, uh, as a reference to Constantine's victory of, over Maxentius in the battle at the Milvian Bridge in AD 312. Due to the legend, Constantine's troops fought and won in that combat under the protection of the mentioned hero symbol. Eusebius of Caesarea reports in his Vita Constantini, Book 1, Chapter uh, 31, citation, these letters the emperor was in the habit of wearing on his helmet at a later period. Citation end. Just a few years ago, some rich helmet fragments from an early 5th century AD deposit, deposit that was plucked out on a field near Castle Hood in the Morris Valley in the Netherlands, confirmed the real existence of such helmet badges. 
Furthermore, this find enabled uh, the identification of much more possible helmet attachments with a hero design. Some of this were formerly thought to be parts of liturgical brooches uh, or else. A very long use of identical shaped helmet badges is possibly indicated by their representation on the helmet of Dea Roma on the diptych of Consul Basilius dated to AD 480 or 441. Depends uh, which Basilius is meant. Uh, generally, it is questionable if with a hero fitting on the helmet an individual religious denomination of the particular soldier was emphasized. Maybe the badge had more the character of an amulet inspired by Constantine's successful wars. As a third possibility, it can be discussed as a hero badges could be one part of the insignia for a special, a special military rank or unit. The main part of the supposed insignia could have been built by some vertical high crest plates to which the hero uh, fittings normally were attached. Usually the crest plates were simply plucked on the helmet ridge and afterwards fixed by wetting their connecting links. This kind of fixation affirmed that the crest plates were not just a temporal decoration for a parade or else. On some helmets, on the other hand, empty and undamaged crest plate slots uh, leads to the conclusion that there was never a plate attached, although the technical possibility for the mounting was given. So perhaps this soldier's dreams of a higher rank never came true. Naturally, the vertical plate was also an additional protection against hostile strikes, but as a reason for the general use of the crest plates, this point was obviously only less important. Facing a well-known friend from the fortress or at Duna Pantel in Takiza in Hungary, it was thought for a long time that vertical high crest plates were a rare special feature of the rich helmets of, of Duna Pantel in Takiza type. By contrary to that opinion, the evidence of crest plate slots on many further helmets, as for example an uh, iron crest band helmet from the context of the late 4th to early 5th century AD in the fortress of Kruivina, Yatros in Bulgaria, or on the helmet fragment of a uh, Dornabek Kasovo type rich helmet of the mid -fourth century, from the mid 4th century uh, AD deposit at Koblenz, Confluentes in Germany, demonstrates that the use of high crest plates was not attributed to special type of helmets. So just now and on various occasions before mentioned dates, give also an imp uh, impression in what chronological space the currently known finds of Roman rich helmets and corresponding representatives of crest band helmets take place. <coughs> so far, most recent items, which were often yet out of use and dismantled uh, when they got into the ground, are known from archaeological context of the late 4th to early 5th century AD. Already for a rich uh, helmet uh, from Conchesti in, in northern Romania, which was found in rich, probably Hanek Cham of the later uh, first half of the 5th century AD, a Roman provenience is very questionable. Although the, uh, the item can be classified as an example of the Dornaba Kasovo type, due to uh, the proportion of his bowl, here compared with the Zazanian helmet of Amlash type, indicate at least a strong oriental influence, if actually not in direct oriental provenience. Such, consider consider such considerations could be underlined even more uh, by its just zonally gilded embossed decorations, which uh, imitates rows of rivets in the same way uh, like <coughs> the ornaments on the cover sheets 
of a helmet from a probably late 6th to early 7th century AD uh, ensemble of grave goods, which is said to be found at Karak Ali Tepper in Northern Ireland. Similar strong uh, oriental influences also appear in the bowl proportions and the close set rivet rows of an unfortunately undated but probably early Byzantine crest bent helmet which is proposed to be found uh, from the Eastern Balkan region. But as it is illustrated by the above mentioned Karak Ali Taper helmet, we have to see, uh, we have to note that in the Zazanian army, not only helmet bowls with uh, high and narrow dimensions were used, but also types of lower and more rounded design. Furthermore, in the case of the helmet from Karak Ali Tepe, of which only the decorative cover sheets of gilded silver and uh, brass uh, remained, some amazing analogies to a group of iron crest band helmets can be realized, which are so far mainly known from undateable context or unlocalized sites in Middle Europe, the Balkans, and Asia Minor. The helmets, uh, these helmets of the so-called Sankt Vit Narona type differ to the 4th century AD types of crest band helmets by their sim uh, very simple constructional design with a characteristic large and wasted flat crest band. Since a long time, uh, a similar designed iron crust bands helmet uh, from a grave at Mainz Bretzenheim in Germany dated to the first third of the sixth century served as one uh, of the real indications for dating of the aforementioned type. But if the stratigraphical observations by Mihal Sayade concerning some helmet fragments in the fortress of Morigiol Halmuris at the Danube Delta in Romania uh, should be correct, we have to assume use of the Sanguid Narona type helmets in the East Roman army already since the first half of the 5th century AD. A similar case could be on hand uh, with a crossed bands helmet from the late uh, Roman to Byzantine fortress at Vovoya, Vojvoda in uh, Bulgaria. Based on local history speculations, that helmet has been also dated to the first half of the 5th century AD. But actually, he was part of a material deposit which cannot be dated closer than to the 5th or 6th century AD. In the matter of uh, his wasted crest band, the last mentioned helmet, as well as uh, the aforementioned items of St. Witt Narona types, seems to be clearly more influenced by oriental helmets uh, like and helmets said to be found from the Amlash region and Northern Ireland than the crest band helmets of the fourth century AD. This impression increased once more with the Byzantine struts helmets of uh, the so-called Baldenheim type, which arised in the later fifth century AD. A special attention should be given to the shape of the struts uh, to the gold-silver contrast of the uh, helmet surface and uh, some decoration details like the rows of close-set rivets on uh, the scale amount, amount of, uh, or the scale uh, ornament on the cheek pieces. All the details have close parallels on the Zanian helmets of Amlash type, but given to some dating problems of the Zazanian finds, it is not always clear who influenced whom. Possibly, we have to take also mutual influences into account. Besides the helmets of the Baldenheim type, also another type of Strutz helmets was used by the Roman army, or perhaps more precisely by the East Roman to Byzantine army. Over the last few decades, the dating of these pure iron helmets of Der Almedine Leiden type was uh, continuously under discussion. Nevertheless, the eponymous example 
from an undated context at Der Armedine in Upper Egypt shows so much similar features to the 4th century AD rich helmets of Dörneberg Kosovo type that a dating nearby seems to be plausible. Because of their constructional analogy to the Der Armedine find, probably the helmets of the Leiden variant can be chronologically affiliated uh, as a contemporary or at least a close subsequent phenomenon. Till now, the most important evidence for the dating of that variant came into light during the excavations of 2004 in the Episcopal complex at Swiss Tov Nove in Bulgaria. There have been found the remains of about 30 nearly uniform helmets which were stored into, uh, into one another uh, when the building has been destroyed by an earthquake in AD 557. Furthermore, indications were given, for instance, by a similar iron helmet from the Temple Mount excavation in Jerusalem, where it was documented in a context which can be connected with the Zanian siege of AD 614, or at latest uh, the Muslim occupation of the city in AD 638. But also the accompanied objects of a Leiden variant helmet from an ancient deposit at the fortress of Azenova Krepos in uh, Bulgaria indicate a dating between the 5th and the 7th century AD. So based on the mentioned facts and uh, some evidence, it seems conclusive to date the use of the strut helmets of their Almadina Leiden type so far to a time span from the first half of the 5th century AD up to the first half of the 7th century AD. So their rise would, uh, coincide, co would coincide where it was a decline of the uh, Roman rich helmet. While their main usage would have been run parallel to the use of the Strutz helmets of Baldenheim type. The helmets of the Baldenheim type consists of uh, iron segments, which are often covered with sheets of silver or gilded copper. The segments are uh, connected uh, the segments are connected by fire-gilded struts, which are rarely made of copper alloy, but mostly of nearly pure copper. To date, the first evidence for such helmets comes from an Alemannic male grave found in Gültlingen in Germany in 1901. The burial belongs to the year between AD 460 and 480. Based on constructional features and decoration details, it is possible, according to a research of uh, Mahan Vogt, to divide uh, the <coughs> approximately 40 known items of the mentioned type into four groups, which are, supported, uh, which are supposed to be products of different manufacturing centers. The distribution of the helmets fine spots mainly at the middle and uh, to Western European locations, as well as on Italian and Illyrian sites, led for a long time to the speculation that most helmets could have been manufactured in northern Italian workshops, predominantly under the authority of the Ostrogoths. Even the more recent discovery of fragments of Baldenheim type helmets in some Byzantine settlements at the Balkans do not change uh, the opinion that uh, at least one uh, production group must be of Italian origin. But anyway, uh, as further manufacturing centers also Byzantine fabricate at the Balkans and in the Danube region are now under discussion. Due to the immense similarity of details between the helmets of Baldenheim type and some Oriental Zazanian relatives, it is impossible uh, in any case to deny the Byzantine rule as a technical mediator. In contrast to the Oriental helmets, which normally have struts and crest bands of ungilded copper alloy 
in some ca uh, rare cases, uh, breaths is asserted. The similar construction elements of the uh, Baldenheim helmets mostly consist, as, it is, uh, as, uh, as I have said above, of nearly pure fire-gilded copper. Thus they stay in the material tradition of the connecting elements on, this, uh, on some 4th century AD Roman rich elements. Furthermore, a lead isotopy of pure copper could open the chance to get some more information about its original mining region. Perhaps that information could also lead to further conclusions on the possible locations of the helmet factories. Thereby, we can uh, act on uh, the assumption that with regard to the huge quantity of pure material that was necessary for the helmet production, that the supply of uh, the factories was not dependent on the recycling of old material, but on the direct deliveries from the mines. First results of an uh, isotopy, uh, isotopy pro, uh, project, which is currently performed at the Römisch Germanisch Zentralmuseum at Mainz, suggests with respect to some historical facts like the occupation of, the, of Sardinia uh, by the Vandals in AD uh, 455, uh, the analyzed copper of 10 accidentally elected helmets of the Baldenheim type was probably mainly mined in the northeast and sporadic also the southeast of Asia Minor. The nearest of the contemporary existing state arms factories uh, for which uh, helmet production is literally attested are situated at Constantinople, uh, Nicomedia, and also uh, Antiochia at the Orontes. Therefore, uh, at the current state of the analysis, it seems that the stratsums of Baldenheim types were mainly ma manufactured in the center and the eastern part of the Byzantine Empire. The so far predominantly Western distribution of their fine spots seems to be mostly dependent on original, original depositing customs and special uh, funerary traditions, which led, which led to a better preservation of the objects. So it is not astonishing if, besides a few fragments uh, from an early 17th century AD destruction layer at the Byzantine city of Sarichingrad in Serbia, some of the latest good preserved Baldenheim types helmets uh, are once known uh, from Middle European contexts as from a rich Frankish grave at Morken in Germany, which is dated to the end of the 6th century AD or around AD 600 at latest. At the same time, in the surroundings of the Byzantine army, also iron lamellar helmets of Niederstotzingen type appeared. The type is named after a, a grave find from the uh, last third of the 6th century AD at Niederstotzingen in southern Germany. In Eastern uh, Asia, lamella uh, helmets already stand in a very long tradition. The way to the west was obviously close connected with the migration of nomad tribes through the Eurasian steppes. The final distribution of the helmets, mostly of the well-known Stotzingen type to Middle and South Europe, seems to have been mainly bound uh, to the Danubian advance of the Avars and the followed up migration of the uh, already Avaric influenced Germanic Lombards to Italy. According to this, fragments of lamellar helmets were mostly found in funerary contexts of the mentioned or related tribes. Uh, but due to the last sickness of the iron lamella and uh, the fading consistence of the organic connections, good preserved helmets are very rare. To date, one of the best preserved examples on which also many details of the lamellar's fastening with uh, knotted leather strings can be observed, was found together with parts of a lamellar body armor 
in an otherwise uh, rather modestly furnished grave of the late 6th or uh, early 7th century AD in Rupkite in Bulgaria. Some other uh, more or less complete lamellar helmets from the northern Pontic area and the South Russian steppes, as for instance a well-known old find from the tomb at Kerch, see on the right side, uh, or uh, a more currently found object from a barrow in the region of Kursk below, give an impression of the far-reaching distribution of the Niederstotzingen type and related items. Together with some uh, detailed representations of such, e uh, such helmets, like on a silver gilded brooch from a Frankish grave at Xanten in Germany, the real evidence of full developed lamellar helmets in the closest surroundings of the late Roman and early Byzantine world is mainly concentrated so far to a period from the second half of the 6th uh, up to the 7th century AD. In a more extended environment, on the other hand, first lamellar-like construction of helmet bolts already occurred at the uh, latest at the turn from the 4th to the 5th century AD, as for instance, in a rich step nomadic grave from Barrel 13 at Kishbek, immediately north, north uh, of the Caucasus, or uh, in the stone tomb 3 at Kalkni, near the western coast of the Caspian Sea in the Russian Republic of Dagestan. On the Middle Volga and in the Kama region of European Russia, similar helmet co constructions already perhaps even appeared in the second century AD. But finally, there are no clear indications that those helmets had a really substantial impact to the equipment of the contemporary army a Roman army before the later 6th century AD. The perhaps most important aspect that could lead to a different impression is a huge amount of discussable lamellar helmets worn by Roman soldiers on their representations at the Ark of Galerius in Salonica, dated around AD 303. Also, the lamellar-like construction cheek pieces of an abnormal uh, rich helmet uh, which have been found in an unfortunately undateable context near the Via Claudia Augusta in Bibavir in Austria, may indicate a moderate influence already before the occurrence of the Niederstotzingen type helmets. But even for the 6th century AD, the archaeological evidence, as it is uh, given, for example, by some lamellar helmet fragments from a uh, 5th to the 6th century AD Byzantine fortress on the northeast Pontic coast at Ilchevka in Russia is so rarely, so rarely uh, that it is still impossible to decide whether the helmets were really used by regular Byzantine soldiers or if they were just native equipment of some steppe nomadic federates of the East Roman army. At this point, I want to close my summary about the segmented helmets in the late antiquity because they attempt to enlighten the often postulated further traces of the, the development from the late Roman rich and crestband helmets to the younger Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian relatives of the 7th and 8th century would bless the limits of my lecture. Due to the current stand of research, also some important question must unfortunately remain open. For instance, did there exist essential differences in the equipment with segmented helmets between the Western Roman army and the contemporary Eastern Roman army, thereby especially with the units from Oriental garrisons? By what circumstances was the apparent decline of the Roman rich helmets on the turn to the 5th century reasoned? and what factors supported the followed-up preference of the Strutz helmets? That's also a question. Are these developments may be explainable with a shift of the military and political situation in the Western Roman Empire and the increasing dominance of the Byzantine East during the 5th century AD? Or, at last, 
could by the supposed decline of the former predominant Roman rich helmets a development be apparent, which is lem lamented by Flavius Vegetius in his Epitoma Re Militaris with the words, citations, from the foundation of the city till the reign of the deified Gratian, the infantry army, the infantry army wore cuirasses and helmets. But upon the intervention of negligence and flows, field exercises ceased. The soldiers begin to think their armor too heavy, as they seldom put it on. They first requested leave from the emperor to lay aside the cuirasses and afterwards the helmets. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>